Hey y'all, welcome back for another flip video. Today we're going to be talking about the interwar years. These are the years in between World War I and World War II. After World War I had ended, there was millions of people that were dead, and Europe as a whole was transformed with new boundaries and new countries um, erupting. With Europe in chaos, a new generation of strong leaders kind of promised power and glory for those nations, and nationalism surged. The objectives that we're going to focus on in this video are what happened in the world economically, socially, and politically post-World War I, and then how did European dictators rise to power post-World War I. Golden Hawk historians will explain and analyze the changes to the world economically, socially, and politically worldwide after World War I, and examine the role that nationalism played in Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini's rise to power. While you're watching, make sure that you're taking notes in either Cornell or outline format as we've talked about in class. It's okay if you have to pause or rewind the video to make sure that you're taking good notes. So these are some of the issues that are happening um, post-World War I. When the veterans were returning, they were having a really hard time finding jobs that were available to them. Many of the, Much of Europe was in total devastation, and many of the different powers of jobs that had been available to them pre-World War I were gone. The different countries also needed to rebuild the damaged lands. Much of the trenches had left all of France in ruin, and all of the artillery shells were still available. There was also huge debts. Germany was focusing on playing, paying back their huge reparation payments, trillions of dollars in reparations. And then there was also economic problems that fed social unrest. People were very upset, and it made these radical ideas that the leaders were proposing more popular. And then in addition to that, there was also very few strong leaders, and so the leadership within Europe um, was lacking, and that led to the um, need for new strong leaders. <clears throat> At the end of World War I, the United States was the greatest economic power, both militarily and industrially. But by the end of the 1920s, the U.S. economy was crashing. During World War I, the farms and farmers had supplied much of the world with food and supplies needed to fight the war. But after the war was over and the European farmers were able to go back to work, they stopped needing the American goods as much. Much of the economic growth following the war occurred in industry. There were new um, consumer goods like refrigerators and um, toasters and vacuums that people wanted to buy. There was a lot of weaknesses in the American economy, though. There is a very big dist uh, uneven distribution of wealth between the rich and the poor. The poor were really, really poor, and the rich were really, really rich. Think Great Gatsby. Many Americans were buying consumer goods and stock in businesses on credit. And the stock in businesses meaning that they were buying parts of a business or loaning money to a business to help them grow on credit. This was an arrangement in which a purchaser borrowed money from the bank or other lenders and agrees to pay it back over time. But by the end of the 1920s, many of the consumers were reaching the limit of their credit and could no longer afford to buy the products or stock that had kept the United States economy expanding during the 1920s. By the fall of 1929, consumer spending had slowed and people had stopped buying um, consumer goods. The profits of businesses had also started falling severely because people weren't buying their products anymore. On Thursday, October 24th, investors began selling their shares, meaning that they were selling the investments that they had made in the stock market. And after that, the others also began selling their stock. And pretty soon, everyone sell, sold all their stock, and the stock market started to decline. A group of bankers decided in the United States that this was not good, and so they decided to buy the majority of the stocks, trying to help to prevent a decline. However, it wasn't enough, and the stock market officially classed on Tuesday, October 29th, in which they called Black Tuesday. With the stock market crash, investors, businesses who depended on the investors, and the lenders were in deep financial trouble because they weren't going to have any more money to lend to the businesses, and also those lenders weren't going to get their money back. This economic downturn became known as the Great Depression. The Great Depression had a big effect on the American people. A lot of people were unemployed, businesses started to fail, and banks began to close. President Hoover believed that the government should have a limited role in helping the economy recover, and so he didn't uh, voluntarily give any money to the people who were struggling. And so people didn't want him to be president anymore. And so in 1932, Franklin D. Roosevelt, also known as FDR, was elected president, and he enacted a program called the New Deal, in which he attempted to fight the Great Depression. The New Deal established public works programs to give people jobs, provided welfare relief programs such as Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, and also passed reforms to protect the stock market and banking systems. Many of these we still use today. 
There was also increased government spending. This increased government spending was supported by the economic theory by John Maynard Keynes, who believed that the government could limit or even prevent economic downturns just by spending money, even if it meant an unbalanced budget and going into debt. He believed that increased government spending would help increase economic output. In 1929, the American businesses that were responsible for much of the world's industry um, and were the world's largest leading lender of money. So all these American businesses were helping to support businesses worldwide. Many areas were already having economic difficulties and struggling to recover the, from the effects of World War I before the stock market crashed. All the Allied powers started to be deeply in debt to the United States for recovery, such as Great Britain and um, France. There was also steep reparations after the war that led to severe inflation in Germany, making German money pretty much worthless and crippling the German economy. There was children that were dra pulling around wagons full of money that were still worth nothing, and people started burning the German francs for firewood instead of using it as money because it was just that worthless. America had also passed the Smoot-Hawley Tariff that placed heavy taxes on imported goods, which was trying to encourage Americans to buy American goods to help the economy to um, go back up. But the new tariff just led to European countries and other countries around the world increasing their own tariffs on American goods and leading to a slow of exportation. And as we've talked about before, the greatest balance of trade is exports more than imports. As world trade came to a standstill, prices for trade goods like silk and salt and other uh, main go trade goods that com uh, countries depended upon for all their money started to drop as well. This led to a uh, very good period for totalitarian governments and other dictators to rise. The political and social unrest helped totalitarian or, when government has complete control over country, dictators rise to power. There are three main govern totalitarian governments, Mussolini in, Hit in Italy, Hitler in Germany, and Stalin in the Soviet Union. And totalitarian governments all have some common features. They broke down into political, social, and economic factors. The political characteristics was that the state is always more important than individuals, and you'll kind of see that in the way that the people are treated. The government is controlled by a single political party. Think Nazis in Germany. And there is a powerful dictator that unites the people and symbolizes the government. And they're going to use his image as the one image to rally by the troops behind. The social factors is that the government is going to control all aspects of daily life, including education, propaganda, the media, and all sorts of other stuff. The secret police also is going to use terror and violence to try to enforce government policies. They're going to bully people into believing what they believe and also making sure that the people were following the rules. And finally, economic is that the government is going to be in control of all the business and also direct the national economy and that the labor and business are going to be used to fulfill the objectives of the state. Benito Mussolini became known as Il Duce, or the leader, and wanted to build a great and glorious Italian state. In 1919, he founded the National Fascist Party that encouraged unity and strength for the country. Fascism is an authoritarian form of government that places the good of the nation above everything else, including individual needs and rights. Mussolini has always wanted to rule Italy. He led the March on Rome following World War II that convinced Italy's king to put him as the head of Italy's government. And once he was in power, he moved to establish a dictatorship. He used violence, threats, and political skill to outlaw all opposition and take unlimited power. After he became um, a dictator, he sought to expand the Italian empire by invading and taking over Ethiopia. Soviet leader Vladimir Lenin had died in 1924, and Joseph Stalin became the new leader of the Soviet Union. Stalin took a very different approach to communism than Lenin did, however. He, instead of allowing the people to have power, which was the basis of communism, he turned the government into a totalitarian state in which he had complete power. Stalin's plan to strengthen the Soviet Union through the modernization of the Soviet economy was through his five-year plan. There were other five-year plans as well. The first five-year plan said that the government would be responsible for all major decisions about the production of goods. That five-year plan led to increases in Soviet industrial output by allowing all the industry to be under his plan. Stalin also wanted to increase the Soviet farms output by making millions of small Soviet farms into larger modernized farms. He had taken the land that had been given to the peasants after the Russian Revolution. This made the peasants really angry and so many of them resisted, but any of them that did resist were executed or thrown into the Gulag, a system of hard labor camps in Siberia, the ice-stricken land up in the very northern part of Russia. 
By the mid-1930s, Stalin had absolute power, but was paranoid that people were plotting against him. So he started a campaign that was known as the Great Purge, or the Great Terror, in which he literally purged and got rid of anyone who can, he considered undesirable. During the Great Purge, Stalin sent thousands of communist leaders, military officers, and ordinary citizens to the Gulag, or executed them. His regime overall dominated Soviet life. Children were encouraged to join youth organizations where they were taught the attitude and beliefs that Soviet leaders only wanted them to have. Religion was discouraged and most churches were closed. And then portraits of Stalin were hung everywhere and the streets and cities were renamed to honor him. After World War I, Germany formed a new Republican government called the Weimar Republic. The Republic was very unpopular with the Germans because they blamed the government for the humiliating Treaty of Versailles and for the economic problems that overwhelmed Germany after the war. Following World War I, Adolf Hitler joined a group of right-wing extremists and soon joined the Nationalist Social Party or the Nazi Party. Hitler realized that he had a talent for public speaking and leadership and so he grew, um, quickly rose to power in the leadership of the Nazi power. He eventually attempted to lead an attempt to overthrow the German government, but the attempt failed and he ended up in jail. While he was there, he wrote the book Mein Kampf that described his major political ideas, including the idea of nationalism making Germany great again and the racial superiority of the German or Aryan race. The economic effects of the Great Depression made the German people desperate for a strong leader, one that would promise to improve their lives. And Hitler promised to improve their lives by rebuilding the German military and making Germany into a master race. Through Hitler's nationalist rhetoric, the Nazi party gained many new supporters. And so in 1933, he was appointed to the position of chancellor, which was the most powerful post in the German government. Once in power, he started to arrest anyone who opposed him and bullied the German legislature into giving him dictatorial powers. He slowly was able to build a totalitarian regime through propaganda that glorified him as Fuhrer, which is kind of where we get the Heil Hitler from. Nazi youth organizations shaped the mind of young Germans who pledged complete loyalty to Hitler and Germany and were encouraged to those nationalist ideas. After he was in power, he began to rebuild the German military and improve the German economy. This went exactly against the Treaty of Versailles. Strict ways controls and massive government spending on public works programs helped to reduce unemployment. The key component of the Nazi system was strong anti-Semitic beliefs or the beliefs that were hostile and prejudiced toward Jews. Hitler blamed the Jews for Germany's problem, including the defeat in World War I. Anti-Semitism had a really long history in a mainly Christian Europe and had been around for centuries. He and the Nazi party blended the anti-Semitism that um, had been a, a historical part of um, Europe with the false beliefs that Jews were a separate race completely. Hitler's Nazi government passed also other laws that excluded Jews from mainstream German life called the Nuremberg Laws. The laws created a separate legal status for Jews, eliminating their citizenship and other civil and property rights that they had. The laws defined a Jew not based on their religious beliefs, but on their ancestry, saying that if your grandparent was a Jew, then you were a Jew. On the nights of November 9th and 10th, the Nazi government encouraged anti-Jewish riots across Germany and Austria, which became known as Kristallnacht, or the Night of Broken Glass. On this night, hundreds of Jews were killed, and thousands of Jewish businesses and synagogues were damaged and destroyed. And this was just a little bit of what was yet to come. Now that you've finished watching the video, please walk, read back over your notes and be sure that you have all the necessary vocabulary. Thanks for joining me for this video, and I'll see you in class.